Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, February 12th, 2024. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. You might ask, what is CircuitPython? It's a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We'll, we hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and in the CircuitPython voice channel. Typically, this meeting happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add that calendar to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the at sign CircuitPythonistas Discord role. Just ask in the channel, and anybody with moderator access can do that for you. Um, there is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to the document beforehand. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view parts of the meeting, the video that interests you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we You'll post... You need to unlock your iPhone first. After each meeting, we post the link for the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. We hold this meeting in five parts. I'll explain the parts later as we get to each part. Okay. Let me go back here to the beginning of the meeting. Um, we will start um, with community news. Let me take a timestamp. Uh, so uh, we start out with community news, which is um, a look at sort of the latest news headlines about CircuitPython and Python on hardware in general. And mostly this is taken from our weekly Python on Micro News newsletter done by Ann. Uh, so these are like the top few items from that newsletter. Um, I'll talk about at the end about how I contribute to the newsletter because it really is helpful if, you, if we get um, notices of things that are interesting that you'd like to see in the newsletter. So I will start out um, with the first item, which is actually not in this week's newsletter because it was discovered over the weekend. Um, if you remember, you may be noticed, especially if you have a Mac, that uh, Mac OS Sonoma has a lot of trouble um, dealing with CircuitPy drives um, on CircuitPython boards. This was really kind of a plague of a problem. Uh, Sonoma was delaying writes um, to files uh, long enough so it would write the data and then not write the metadata for many seconds. And this caused the drive to appear to be corrupt to um, CircuitPython. It also caused write problems when you were writing large number of files, and it generally was a real mess. Um, there were some workarounds, but they were quite painful. Well, as of Mac OS 14, Sonoma 14.4 Beta 2, this problem appears as if it has been fixed. Um, I'll thank some people for working on that later, but uh, there's a link in the notes to the blog post that I wrote about these problems, and it notes that there's an update. And I've also updated um, the CircuitPython, um, the thread on this in, uh, posted by the CircuitPython user on Fostodon, which is a Mastodon, a Mastodon uh, server. So um, we're really happy about this because it, it's been a real problem for a long time. Uh, next up, uh, uh, there's a really cute um, submarine hunting game that was done partially with CircuitPython. There's um, a link to a Twitter post about it. Um, 
but for something called Global Game Game Jam, uh, Piotr Gaksowski and his team built a 3D game using a mix of 2D and 3D assets found uh, in their garages, etc. Um, and it's about uh, somebody who's, it, it simulates someone uh, running a, a nuclear submarine. The vessel is controlled using discarded washing machine front, uh, front panel as the control panel. There's an oscilloscope. Anyway, it looks really cute. So there's a link to the notes um, in the notes doc to that uh, Twitter post with a lot of um, photos. Uh, next item is called uh, How to Fail with Circuit Python. And this is a really nice uh, little thing that uh, author FedE2, F-E-D-E-2, um, wrote in the Adafruit Playground, it's, which is sort of like a user level learn guide about uh, how to handle failures in CircuitPython, soft and hard failures. And uh, go ahead and look at the link for that. So all these, all these things, um, except for the Mac OS Sonoma problem, which will show up in next week's newsletter, I'm sure, uh, are from the Python and Microcontrollers weekly newsletter, which is run by the CircuitPython community, and it's emailed every Monday. Uh, a link to all the archives is in the notes document. Uh, the newsletter highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. You can contribute to this newsletter by uh, submitting a PR to the GitHub repo where the newsletter is assembled, or you could email cpnews at adafruit.com, or you could tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon or Blue Sky or X. Any of the things uh, uh, will get our attention and uh, we'll really highly consider anything submitted for incorporation in the newsletter. So thanks very much. All right. Um, the next section is called uh, The State of CircuitPython, the Libraries, and Blinka. Um, this is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers uh, separate from our uh, individual status updates. So first up, overall, uh, I'll say that we've had 25 pull requests merged in the last week by 17 authors. Um, some new authors I haven't seen before are Python MCPI, um, Jan Volk, uh, Login G. Smith, and Linkior. And uh, of those 25 pull requests, they were reviewed by six reviewers. And there were 16 issues closed by 11 people and 17 opened by 12 people. So we're still kind of even on how many issues are happening. Uh, next up is a report on the CircuitPython core. And Scott, are you available to read that? Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Dan. Um, OK, so in the core for the last week, we had 12 pull requests merged from eight different authors. Uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to Just Mobilize and Katni and Jerry Nudell for, uh, and Foamy Guy for all being core contributors this week. Um, Andy Bing and W. Tamura are common translators, so thanks to those folks as well. Uh, we had three re reviewers, including Foamy Guy. So thanks to Foamy Guy for doing some reviewing in the core. Um, we have 24 open pull requests, which is one under that one page limit, which is great. Uh, many, many of these are open for a long time issues that uh, are particular boards. So please uh, take a look at those again. Um, if you have a certain board, that could be super helpful to get those finished. Um, although, yeah, some of them are difficult as well. Uh, we had 10 closed issues by seven people and nine open by six people. So, uh, you know, high single digits participation and we're down one. So that's been great. We have a total of 683 open issues. Um, we, we prioritize those issues for Adafruit funded folks through the milestone system. Um, so the, the, miles, the milestones we're looking at particularly right now are 9.0, which has 36 open issues. These are things that we want to deal with or punt on for the 9.0 uh, next major stable release. Uh, we had two open issues for 10.0, which are basically things that we want to remember to do when we do the next major version. And then also we have 12 open issues for 9xx. Uh, at the time these stats were grabbed, we had four issues not assigned to milestone, which is not uncommon for over the weekend. So 
uh, we'll just have to make sure that we triage everything as it comes in. And that's it for the core. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, next up is libraries. And uh, Foamy Guy, are you available for that? Yep, I will tell you about the libraries. So this section covers all of the CircuitPython libraries, which are Python level code that implements either drivers for specific bits of hardware or uh, helper libraries that allow you to build your projects at a bit higher level and not worry about as many of the lower level details. You can find all these libraries on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore and then the name of the library. Uh, across all those libraries this week, we had 10 pull requests merged uh, by nine authors, which is great to see uh, nine authors. A couple of the names that were newer to me, which I, uh, I think maybe Dan mentioned, but I uh, don't know for certain. So I do want to call out uh, Python, MCPy, uh, Linkior, and uh, Logan D. Smith. Those are a couple names that are less familiar to me. So those might be newer or less frequent contributors uh, who are much appreciated, as are all of the uh, more frequent contributors, too. Um, across those 10 pull requests, we had five reviewers this week, uh, mostly the usual suspects, thanks to Jeff, uh, my, uh, let's see, Jeff, Scott, Dan, uh, Carter, and myself. Um, of our pull requests that were merged, the oldest one was 73 days. We had another one that was 62 days, and the rest are between one and four days. Uh, those are all listed here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look at them. That leaves us with 47 pull requests open. Uh, the oldest one is 543 days, and the newest one is just one day. Um, over the last seven days, we had six issues closed by six people and seven new issues opened up by six people. That leaves us with a total of 737 open issues, and of those, there are 19 that are labeled good first issue. Um, which uh, is a great time to tell you about contributing to CircuitPython. If you would like to get started contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, you can check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. On that page, you'll find a list of open PRs and open issues. And uh, if you're looking to contribute, it's a great place to start. Uh, if you want to get started in reviewing, you can look at the list of open PRs. Uh, find PRs that are for libraries you have hard, uh, hardware for or knowledge about or just an interest in. Uh, you can go and test out those PRs or just take a look over the code and leave comments on GitHub about what you find. Uh, once you get comfortable with that, we can level you up to the review team to where you can leave the official reviews uh, in GitHub, but uh, comments are appreciated all the same too. Um, if you're interested in actually contributing code, you can take a look through the open issues and try to find one that you've gotten interest in or hardware for and try to knock out uh, your own PR for it to submit. Um, the ones that are identified as being best for folks with less experience or who are just getting started are labeled with the good first issue label. On that circuitpython.org slash contributing page, uh, if you do click over to issues, you can use a drop down near the top of the page to search um, to filter by those labels in order to highlight the ones that have that good first issue label if that's what you'd like to uh, define. So um, we want to help you contribute in whatever way you can, whatever skill level you have. So we've got guides that cover all the different parts of the process uh, between Git and GitHub and uh, CircuitPython and the libraries and everything else. So if you need help, don't hesitate to ask uh, in the Discord and uh, folks are always around to help get you pointed in the right direction. Uh, rounding out the rest of the library stats for the week in uh, in PyPI numbers, we had, uh, oh wow, we cracked uh, 200,000. So we had 207,619 PyPI downloads across the 324 libraries um, this week. And the uh, list of updated libraries in the last seven days includes HTTP server, uh, Bitbang IO requests, uh, US 100, and uh, over in the community bundle, the Mag Cal library. Uh, so check those out if you would like. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Foamy Guy. I, guess I had a question in library PyPy weekly download stats. So two hundred seven thousand is that for that's for all time. Is that right? I, I think, think it's, it's last week. I think it is. Yeah, no, I think it is the past week. I do think there are. Uh, like automated tools. So oh, okay. I think those numbers represent like just all pip installs across. Um, I don't know for certain, but I do, I believe it's a rolling window. Okay, because this, 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 these are PyPy downloads. And so PyPy is not used 
is used mostly by people who are using Linux single board computers or who are using Thani. And right. It's not, yep. It, it does not include downloads of libraries through the library bundles. So it's it's sort of interesting, but it's not a very it's not a good picture about like the regular li library downloads for use on boards in general. Right. Yep. Uh, or or Circup, I believe as well, is not not yeah, included Circup in there. So yeah, there's a couple right. segments that it doesn't catch. It doesn't contribute to these counts. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Next up is uh, the Blicka status, and uh, Melissa, could you read that? Sure. Uh, so this uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for uh, MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had three pull requests merged by two authors and two reviewers. There are currently six open pull requests. Um, there were zero closed issues and uh, by zero people and one opened by one person and that leaves a net of 82 open issues. Uh, there were 15,022 PyPI downloads in the last week. There were 11,107 PyWheels downloads in the last month and we are at 129 boards. And that's it. Okay, thank you Melissa. All right. Uh, next up, we'll move on to Hug Reports, uh, which is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start. It will go down the list alphabetically. Um, if you're text only or missing the meeting, I'll just read your notes when I get them to, the, in, to them in the list. So as I said, I'll start. Um, um, first of all, uh, Thanks to Romkey and ADCC for retesting the latest Mac OS Sonoma uh, beta and finding out that it's fixed uh, the um, delayed write problem. It's really helpful that people are keeping track of this and it's a great news about this, as I mentioned earlier in community news. Uh, thanks to Jerry for figuring out why the Espressif ES32 SDI camera board build uh, stopped working, the camera part stopped working and PRing a fix to that. There's still some mystery about that, but the fix is working. We're having to have to understand how the default configuration for cameras works. Thanks for, to Catney for redoing the Pi Moroni Inky Frame 7.3 inch board PR. Um, that's now merged. Uh, thanks to Justin for doing a cascading set of PRs that clean up uh, sort of Python typing and also prepare for Justin's connection manager code. It's it's been like Justin has to keep moving backward to, to uh, and fix things in uh, dependent in prerequisite libraries in order to get connection manager to uh, be the best it can be. And thanks to Scott uh, for another catch up meeting I had with him when I came back from vacation. Okay, next up is uh, C Grover, who's text only, so I'll read theirs. Thanks to John Park for the Fader Wave project. The design was perfect for creating a physical test bed to create SynthIO wavetables and envelopes using Fourier series overtones. And next up is DJ Devon. Uh, thank you. I have a hug to Foamy Guy, Jepler, and Kmatch, who three years ago added a wrap to wrap text to pixels functions which is basically word wrap could i ask you can uh, you turn up your your microphone you're very low uh, oh uh that's better that's great okay go ahead uh yeah it was a, a word where i had a use i needed a, a way to use word wrap text in a display io project so i went back all the way in the back of uh get history to find out who made that function just to thank them because it saved me so much time um, and if you take a look at the, the function, you'll see that it's not a trivial thing to, to word wrap text. Um, so, you know, three years later, gifts keep on giving. Thank you, guys. Uh, a hug to Jepler for an example in a GitHub-related issue f on spy bus sharing with SD card IO. I was able to use six less GPIO pins on a new PCB design. Thank you for the lesson on spy bus sharing. Uh, a hug to Justin for the work you're putting into Connection Manager. Having a consistent method for socket use is highly desirable, and you've made it some neat infrastructure improvements along the way. It's been enjoyable seeing your progress updates and engaging with the community. 
a hug to Dan H for updating a lot of this, a lot of display drivers with that use uh, Spy Display and, and Four Wire to be both 8x and 9x compatible. So it's kind of a transitional code um, for the the imports, and it it does work uh, very well. Uh, so that was very helpful. A hug to C. Grover for his touch calibration code. Even though it's not specifically designed to help people write touch drivers, it does help you write touch drivers. And that's what I got. Okay, thank you. Um, next up is ADCC. All right, hi there, everyone. Uh, first off, hugs to uh, Dan and Scott for always being there with exactly the incisive responses I've needed to keep making progress on BLE for RP2. And uh, just hugs to all the people who uh, worked on solving the Mac OS Sonoma bug. Uh, it was Apple's bug to fix, but I think our analysis and reports gave them the prod they needed to fix it. That's it. Okay, thanks. And I'll note that uh, somebody who had submitted an, a um, feedback to Apple, basically an issue, did was acknowledged in theirs that uh, the, the bug was resolved. Um, Lady Ada had also submitted one and she looked in her update and it's not yet marked there, but hopefully it'll start showing up in all the places that where we complained about it. It did show up in mine. Great. That's good to hear. Okay. Uh, Foamy Guy, you're next. All right. Uh, this week I have hug reports uh, for Scott. Um, thanks for working on the uh, SD card visibility through the web workflow. Uh, that makes it really convenient compared to unplugging the SD card and putting it into an adapter in order to see or copy the files uh, from it. You could just keep it, uh, keep it plugged in and keep it connected and just access those files with the web workflow. It's really, really nice. Um, thanks to Jeff for working on JPEG IO in the core. Uh, it's really cool to have support for new image format uh, for display IO. And thanks to Justin and DJ Devin3, both for helping folks on the Discord and the Help with CircuitPython channel. Thanks. Okay. And next up is uh, Jeff, who's, um, who's missing the meeting, so I'll read his. Uh, thanks to Todd Bott and JP. Thanks for lunch and chat while I was visiting LA. Okay. And next up is Jerry. Uh, hi, uh, it's a group hug, and uh, thanks to everybody for, for letting me play here. It's a, really a wonderful place to hang out and have fun. All right, thanks, thanks. very much, yes, uh, Jerry. Uh, next up is Justin. Yeah, I just wanted to give a thanks, uh, kind of a double thanks to Tenute for helping uh, move Connection Manager along, did that initial um, PR review, and also um, for pointing me to an issue that they were having uh, with typing. Um, it was, it felt really good to be included in something to see that um, the effort of the time I put in um, has started making people actually think about me and point out issues that are happening. Um, and then also uh, to Dan and Jepler for helping me work through that issue a little bit um, to try to figure out some things that were um, well out of my understanding of how things were currently set up. Okay, great, thank you. All right, next on to uh, Maker Melissa. Hi, I wanted to give a hug to all the folks watching the macOS CircuitPython compatibility issue. Uh, I've been waiting to upgrade because of that issue. And group hug to everyone else. OK. And uh, finally, Scott. Hello. Uh, echoing back to Justin, uh, thanks for helping folks on the Discord <laughs> jumping into the Python typing rabbit hole and uh, also working on Connection Manager. I think we've, we've, just, we've seen that it's going to be super valuable to, to get all that stuff unified, so thanks for working on it. Um, hugs to Romkey for doing the initial testing on the latest macOS beta. I know other folks followed up, but thanks to them. Uh, hug to ESP Sprite uh, for getting back to me on the ESP32 forum. They got back to me within like six hours or something, which was great, and gave me gave me the lead I needed for continuing my IDF5 escapades. A uh, hug to Jerry for uh, testing 9.0, and also a hug to Fede2 for the failing with CircuitPython Adafruit Playground post. I thought it was really insightful and, and happy to see that there. So thanks to all of them. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, next up is uh, status updates. Um, this is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. 
I'll start and we'll go through the list as before. Um, when I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to the in the weeds section. So I will start. Okay, as we mentioned um, several times, so Mac OS Sonoma 14.4 beta 2 seems to fix this delayed write issue that we were that was really plaguing uh, the use of circuit python dri circuit pi drives on Mac OS. So we really hope that this fix sticks. There is a regression before it comes uh, the final comes out and we'll continue to test as each beta and the RC come out. Uh, it, given this uh, Apple's usual schedule on this the 14.4 final version will probably come out uh, sometime in March. And that's also a time when they're, they're announcing new hardware, I believe. Um, otherwise, uh, besides that, I've been shepherding various PRs and uh, doing various bug investigations, uh, trying to fix the issues that we need to fix for um, 900 final. And relevant to that, uh, I would like to do a 900 beta 1 soon, but there's a new uh, bug that seems to, has to do, have to do with um, network socket use on ESP32 S2. So we'd like to fix that before uh, beta 1 ships. So we don't have a regression for that. So we'll wait on beta 1 until we can do something about that. All right, and uh, next up is DJ Devon. Thank you. Uh, this week, I received my ST7796S SPY TFT Feather Adapter Prototype PCBs, and I'll post an image of that. The adapter basically turns the display into a TFT Feather Wing. I only made one mistake during trace routing and have already fixed it in the next revision. Adafruit doesn't use this specific display, so I had to write a uh, CircuitPython display driver for it. And as a display demonstration, I'm updating a word wrap label using uh, the, the display IO uh, to display the introduction of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I have successfully tested the built-in SD card reader with SD card IO, thanks to some example code uh, that Jepler unwittingly posted in a Git issue uh, that I just grabbed real quick that was very helpful. I successfully adapted and updated a CircuitPython XPT2046 touch driver control, which I don't think Adafruit uses. Um, they might use it in the ILI display. Uh, it was written by Derek McMillan in CircuitPython, um, but it needs to be updated with, you know, some latest, the latest and updates and stuff. It was based on a driver by user R Dagger for MicroPython that was in 2021. And this morning, oh, sorry, um, I added Seek Rover's min-max calibrator to the touch driver. And this morning, I got the touch driver working and drew on the resistive display with the stylus. Still working on improving the touch detection with uh, when the display is rotated. And I'm over the moon happy because I got that working. Finally, everything works. That's it. All right. Thank you. All right. And next up is ADCC. Oh, confirmed. By tracing that Apple has indeed fixed that Sonoma bug. Um, and uh, Dan, if you want to get ping me later uh, about the tracing code. Uh, continuing work on BLEIO for RP2. Scanning and advertising now work and overall stability is improving by the build. This week I'm digging into timer problems that seem to stem from assumptions in the Pico SDK about how BT stack is plumbed in and used. I've already bypassed most of BT stack and knit in the SDK and will likely have to bypass the rest. Anyway, that's it for me. All right, thank you. All right, uh, we'll have Foamy Guy next. All right, thank you. Uh, last week I finished up work on the USB host uh, keyboard text editor project and the guide for that was published. Um, I do have a couple of more advanced features in the back of my mind that i like to maybe uh, pick it up after a while and attempt, but I don't know for sure if I can actually succeed, and I suspect it'll be quite difficult. So it was nice to get the, uh, the guide done and set that down to work on some other stuff for a bit. Um, after that, I have started to work on some prototype code for my next project, which will be uh, 
for making photo frame overlays with the Memento camera eventually, although I've been working on some alternative hardware for the moment. Um, kind of similar to like photo booths that you can go to where you will take a photo and it will kind of let you choose from a border uh, or maybe even some like stickers and things to put on top of the photo. Um, in the process, I've been, uh, it, it's been a fun but challenging deep dive into some more image processing uh, and especially differences between color spaces and how the color converter class fits into everything with Display.io, but I am uh, grokking a little bit more uh, each time I mess with it, so it's nice. Um, I made some modifications in Bitmap Saver that allow it to work with a color converter uh, because the current one only works with a palette, um, and that seems to be working, but I haven't submitted it uh, as PR yet, uh, so I'll get that done this week. And then I am uh, overall kind of trying to work towards getting all three of the JPEG decoding, the bitmap tools operations, and the bitmap saver exporting to play nicely together and output everything into colors that actually look correct. Uh, I have gotten close to where different parts look correct, but not other parts, um, but not quite all the way there just yet with everything. And I might uh, start poking around in the core to see if there's something I can add either to uh, bitmap tools or to color converter that maybe help with some part of the process, but I got to wrap my head around what's going wrong um, before I can actually do that. So that is where I'm at. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. I'll read Jeff's next. Um, did some POSIX port work during downtime on vacation. That's uh, Jeff's working on uh, the Unix port and making it more like Circuit Python, which we use it. We use the Unix port for testing. Um, getting back Tuesday, that's tomorrow. We'll figure out what to work on then. Okay, uh, next up is Jerry. Yeah, um, so just been spending a bunch of time playing with the various cameras and forged support cameras. The new Memento has been, been fun and it's working really well. Uh, and I had fun with the older ESP32 S3Is and, and now I've been trying to work with the uh, Metro ESP32 S3 because it's got enough pins to make it worthwhile to hook a camera up to it so lots of mixed results and a lot of it is just stumbling across things but um it's making progress and still a lot to learn about these things and the cat's trying to help um and then um yeah i keep stumbling across some some of the 9.0 issues so it's it's fun to, to you know help ferret them out and um um I, as i come across i'm trying to open up coherent issue reports to so they, and they and again appreciated how fast they've gotten dealt with. Um, and I'm really proud of myself yesterday for actually being able to remember how to submit a core PR. Um, um, it was a you know one line trivial change to a file, but it was a uh, a lot of pieces had to come together. So that was fun. All right, That's it. thank you for that PR. Uh, next <laughs> up is, is Justin. Yeah, so I learned quite a bit about some of the stuff for how we were doing typing um, since I've been knee deep in the requests in the mini MQTT library. When I was looking at the typing, I was like, wow, this is the exact same typing stuff in this library that they have pasted in requests. Um, and thus that I had copied over to Connection Manager and was able to um, drop out a whole roughly just shy of a kilobyte of data um, because although MicroPython doesn't use typing. It doesn't stop it from getting compiled if there's definitions into the MyPy file. Um, so it's been a long time since I've been this excited about removing that much data from um, a Python file. Um, most of my stuff is large scale stuff. And so if it's megs or gigs, it really doesn't matter. So that was really fun. Um, as I said, got forward progress on the connection manager, um, got it moved over into the Adafruits um, domain and initial review. So started working through some of that. Um, kind of one of the big um, comments that I got in there was kind of the complexity of the difference between kind of how requests does um, retries and uh, mini MQTT does. Um, and so opened up a PR to potentially simplify at least one piece of that. Obviously, mini MQTT, we want to be mindful of if it actually starts communicating um, with MQTT server and there's issues um, to keep that delayed um, retry so we don't just flood that, but for a regular, like can't connect to the, you know, physically can't connect the socket. 
um, we can pull some of that complexity out. So opened up that PR, um, at least to get thoughts and see if I'm missing something. So that's kind of what I got today. All right, thank you. All right, and uh, we have uh, Maker Melissa next. Um, I'm working on getting the Snake Eyes bonnet working with the newer Raspberry Pis. I updated the Python code to use Blinka, which now is an, as HDMI only, and I'm currently working on updating the frame buffer C code. I have it compiling with 64-bit and outputting to the TFT displays. And that's it. Okay, thank you. And um, our last person for um, status updates is Scott. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm still working on my RMT P count, pulse counter and timer API updates internally. Uh, I'm testing them now. A lot of last week was spent uh, messing around with protomatter and RGB matrix stuff. Um, I did get it working. It's just um, really challenging to try to get code that runs when the, the flash cache is unavailable. So that, that's been tough. Um, I do want to get back to this week. I'm, I'm, I've got an order to get some high density NeoPixels for testing. So I'm going to spend just a day this week sometime just testing the S2, the S3, and the ESP32 with NeoPixels just to make sure that on the S3 and ESP32 they work okay. Um, there's some differences between the different ESP chips that make it harder or easier to make sure that NeoPixels don't flicker. Um, so I'm going to do that. I also want to move on to, once I'm out of ESP, I want to get out of ESP land and onto the IMX RT. Uh, there's a few things there uh, to test, including bus IO stuff. So <clears throat> I'm going to do that. And I'm, I've been updating this implementers guide that I started last year. Uh, and I want to I want to work on that some more. Um, and then Jerry mentioned the trouble with S2 and HTTPS connections. So uh, I might tag team that with Dan and Jerry uh, probably today or tomorrow just to to try and make that a little bit better. But the S2 is really not really not a favorite chip of mine. The S3 is much much better. Yeah, Scott. Just to clarify, the problem is I've I've been reporting on S3s, not S2s. Oh. So, okay. Yeah, there's yeah. Uh, there maybe two different problems going on here. Yep. Yeah, could be. Yeah, I did some aggressive like turning off some SSL protocols, so it's possible I was a little too aggressive with that. Yeah, uh, yeah. the the recent one that I came on across yesterday uh, was all about S3 stuff, and that was all okay. the um, uh, running out of uh, retries on the hmm. uh, okay. connections. Yeah. All right, well, that's good to know. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. OK, so now we're uh, to the, in the weeds section where we have some long can have some longer discussions um, that folks have identified ahead of time or maybe that came out of a status update. So um, make sure if you think of an in the weeds thing, add it when we get before we get to the section so we'll know uh, what we're dealing with here. So I have one thing uh, to say um, about um, we've been talking uh, in our internal meetings um, Someone, a user noticed noted to me like that GIF IO was not turned on on the Feather TFT, ESP32 S3 Feather TFT. And it was like, that's weird. Why, that's like very useful to have that if you want to play uh, GIF animations, for instance. So um, uh, what can we do about that? Um, and the reason it's turned off is that for some larger translations, it just doesn't fit. Um, so the problem that we have on these boards is that four megabyte of flash, even though it sounds like a lot, uh, is actually less than we would want. Um, one reason is that there's just a lot of code in the ESP IDF. So when we add all kinds of features, it does grow that uh, substantially. And the other is that um, we have uh, an over the air update partition. So there's a firmware partition, which right currently is 1.4 megabytes. And then the OTA partition is the same size because if you're doing an over-the-air update of CircuitPython, and we have code to do that, uh, it's called dual bank. Um, it, you, you need reserved space so that you can switch partitions. 
or copy it in and then copy it over to the other place. I, I don't remember exactly how it works. So um, what we think we're going to do for 900 is, is um, turn off uh, BLE support on these boards with smaller um, uh, four megabyte flash because we have other things that we want to be on on those boards. And BLE is that does not work all that well right now anyway on uh, ESP32 S3 because um, it's, it's incomplete. You can't act as a BLE peripheral and advertise services. That's not available. You can only act as a central. And it's just, uh, so it's just sort of not that useful. So we think we're going to turn this off for 900. We might turn it back on later when we can figure out maybe how to trim these a little bit. Um, Anecdata notes uh, how many people actually use over the air OTA update. Uh, we could consider turning it off by default. And then we have larger firmware and we could have a larger user file system. And um, I would say, I think the issue there is it's some people may, we don't really know how many people use OTA. We don't really know how many people need, need these other things. It's very hard to tell. So uh, um, we can consider turning it off. We can consider having two builds uh, that just keeps increasing the number of builds that we have. We already have, you know, 500 builds or something. So, uh, I guess the question is not, we're well, not 500, but a lot. Um, so the question is uh, like, does the sort of initial plan that we have sound okay to you or what other things that might you think about and uh, this business about OTA or not? I mean, ideally you could say like, well, the best thing would be like, oh, I could just have a custom build and I'll, uh, get what I want, but we don't have the infrastructure for doing that right now. So are there, are there any comments on this? Uh, DJ Devin asks, would we still progress for BLE with 16 or 8 megabyte flash? Yes. Yes. Because in ESP IDF 5, they made, we were, we were blocked on BLE support on ESP32 because there was a fundamental um, deficiency in the BLE stack that you couldn't add services dynamically at runtime, which is what CircuitPython expects. And that is now uh, possible because they, the ESP folks added that feature to Nimble. So um, I guess that's what the question, I, I'm curious, has anybody used the over the air update feature who's here now? <laughs> No. Okay. <laughs> what we guys says I didn't know OTA updates were even right, were even right. possible. I mean, I you know this Dan, but I like I'll say it publicly. Like I really pushed to keep OTA there. Yeah. Because I know I know that um Lamore and I really want to push people on the web workflow. And um and you know, Jerry's asking, is there a guide for OTA? Like I don't think there is now, but there, I think there is a future where we are going to want to do it. Um, we've talked a lot about the Toy Hacker board being like kind of our first um, enclosed board where you really don't have USB, you only use web workflow. And I think that the moment that you have something where it is like, it's sold as something where it's wireless, you're going to want OTA as well, right? Like you're not going to want to just update Circuit Python code. There's always this possibility that there's going to be a bug that you hit that you want to be able to update over the air. Um, so I think that I know we don't use it now, and we added it long ago because we were going to use it. But I think this is the year. I think this is the year that we actually do start using it more, um, especially because web workflow is being more and more adopted. So I think more and more people will rely on having a wireless thing, and I don't think you're going to want to not have wireless CircuitPython kind of core updating without it. I think um, what, is, what is true right now is that we don't have the OTA feature that support that's there is available only through CircuitPython. It isn't available externally through some a sort of out of band th feature in the web workflow. Um, right, like the supervisor wouldn't manage an OTA update for you. Right, right. We, we haven't written the code to do that. 
Yeah. Mode. Right now, right. you can write CircuitPython code to do an OTA update, but you can't initiate one without having that CircuitPython code. Right, which is not super clear to me what you, like, do we need it as a core feature or not? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think if it's, if you really can't have access to the USB socket in, for some reason, then maybe it has to be a core feature, but I don't know, or if it's much more difficult. Yeah, and I was thinking about that, like, you, you need to make sure, you also probably need OTA bootloading. Um, yes. Or at least you need core support of, like, if you safe mode in the updated version, you can actually try by switching back to the old version, that sort of thing. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's details here, but I really, I do think people are going to want it once we do it. Um, and so I don't want to be super quick to get rid of it. And I, you know, microdev added a thing. So the other OTA partition by default gets used for user file system now too. Yeah. Which is a bit weird. And we're going to have to deal with that when this happens as well. So I guess another question is whether people are using the limited BLE feature that we're having, we have on these four megabyte boards, but I think very few people are using BLE also. So um, I think the work, the sort of the stopgap is to take that away temporarily so that right. we can make the boards more functional for their primary purpose. Like the TFT boards, you really want to have image processing more than BLE. That's more important. Right. And maybe not even like camera stuff, but just like GIF and JPEG yeah. support. Um. It's, it's also true that we do try to pick modules that have the largest flash possible right and so it's but uh, as anic data points out the mini actually has the mini has eight if you don't have ram and four flash if you have two megs of ram right right so the mini which is what we unfortunately use on the boards um is 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 limited in that way you can't there's eight zero or there's four two uh, or four something. i just i just pulled i just pulled it is four two yeah, yeah. i just looked it up all right so we'll just this is just sort of a warning basically a heads up on this. Yeah. And, and those of you who think it'd be nice to have BLE on the 4 meg um, version, it's not clear to me that once we actually added all the support to make it complete, we'd be able to fit it. Yeah. <laughs> that was the other thing I was thinking about. I was like, we don't know whether we could actually fit like BLE IO proper to the 4 megs anyway. That's so I'd rather just... Yeah. And a lot of them have it turned off anyway. That was... I did a, a number of them already. This is just kind of making it a, a more uniform blanket statement. Right. It's making it sort of official. That's a good point. Okay. Um, so now I, let's we can move on to Jerry's um, item, which I think is interesting. Uh, you want to, Jerry? You want to describe what you're asking? Sure. You know, the the learn guide things are so are so nice. You know, when you go through and you want to grab the code and you just hit the little button that says you know download the pack the bundle. It's cat here. <laughs> oh, oh. And um. The um, but but you know right now what they do is they generate a zip file with a a build with all the MPY files for 8.x and a separate one for all the 9.x. But I know I like to use the .py files. Um, so I just wondered if it's a trivial thing to add in a switch so that you know to generate that as well into the zip file. Is that something worth doing? Does anyone else care? Um, you know it's it's real. I find it is really nice to just download the uh, the zip file and be able to use it but then i find myself usually just manually copying all the uh all the py files onto the board anyway i i do that all the time for debugging reasons anyway so right I, it's like i download the project bundle i try it it doesn't work and then i go and copy the the py file for the library right and we're that's the, the library. That's maybe you know for the general user maybe it's you know not worth it, but it, if it's like I said, if it's if it's trivial, I don't know what the scripts look like that generate these things. But if it's a trivial addition to just generate one more, one more folder in that file, um, I certainly would appreciate it. I don't know if anyone else would. I I think it's not hard, and I think that um, as long as it's labeled properly, so people don't copy it uh, by default, uh, we make clear it's you know. Python source only, or you know, for debugging or something, then I think it's okay. And um, the question is really, is it going to add to the support burden in some way? 
Right. And exactly. It, 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 you know, it is, and you know, it's not worth a lot of effort on anyone's part. But in fact, it also is true that people often we often ask people when we are supporting them, they they we tell tell them to to download the source version anyway, and then we have to tell them where to get it. So in this in this case, they're getting the latest version automatically. So I think I right. think this is worth bringing up. Um, I don't think it's going to be hard either. Yeah, I think we just we have to ask. Um, Justin. Just the yeah, okay. our, our our internal person named Justin who works on Learn Dev, who wrote the code. All right. Well, I just thought I'd put the request out there, and you know, if it can go anywhere, that's that'd be great. But you know, if it's if it's a, right. if it's not worth the effort, then by all means, don't do it. Uh, I think while I think on that topic, though, one thing I noticed is all of the builds have bus device in them, and yet I believe now all the boards. Is, are there any boards that don't have bus device frozen? Yeah, there's very small ones that don't. Okay, then I guess it's worth it. All right. Right, and yeah, okay, thanks. we can't get rid of. Well, there are many, so many projects that are not going to run on the small boards, like you know, a Matrix Portal S3 project. That's an interesting thing. I mean, I think it's even a little confusing that uh, bus device is there. But that's another. That's a, that's sort of another thing to think about. You can. Why don't you put that in the notes, Jerry, if you really, and I'll, maybe, or we can make an issue about it, as well. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure how to fix that, but um, because the the code that generates the bundles doesn't really know anything about what kind of board it's doing it on. Okay. Uh, DJ Devon asks, uh, can it be moved to an Amazon S3 bucket like nightly builds? You mean the bundles? The bundles are generated dynamically uh, when you click the project bundle download link. It's, it's on, done in the web server. Uh, I thought the, the question was getting rid of it to avoid user confusion to get rid of am i uh, no, apparently i am completely wrong ignore me okay okay <laughs> right the idea is you want the mpy files there but you might also want the pi files if you if you want to do any any debugging or instrumenting of the libraries just to make it easier to get the source files for the libraries that you're using okay all right, does anybody have anything else they'd like to bring up? Okay, well, I will say next week is U.S. Holiday President's Day, if I'm not mistaken, right? So uh, next week, the meeting will be on Tuesday. It'll be delayed a day since Monday is an official U.S. holiday. And so I'll note that in the um, follow-up, and I'll put that in the wrap-up here uh, later. So if there's nothing, anything else that anybody like to discuss? If not, uh, I will stop recording. Stop recording.